And for them, as I've already said, at the kind of core of logic is the sort of thing that goes on in the prior analytics. What goes on in the prior analytics is basically a survey of the different ways of, com I'm sure you all know this, but it's basically a survey of the different ways of combining propositions of certain forms, like some A is B, or all A is B, or no A is B. And what Aristotle does is he just puts these together in various ways, and he says, this syllogism doesn't produce any conclusion, this syllogism does produce a conclusion, here's what it produces, and so on, right? Then he also goes on and apply, and by the way, most historians of logic think this is really awesome, this part of the prior analytics, that it's really good. Um, historians of logic, I think, tend to be less impressed by what he does next, which is apply modal notions to these very same syllogisms, so people have complaints about that. But the whole enterprise is very impressive. And one of the things that's impressive about it, which I always uh, emphasize when I'm, I, probably I don't need to tell you this, but with some audiences I feel the need to really emphasize that in a way the big breakthrough here is, and something that Aristotle is the first to do, is simply the use of letters as variables. Right, so it's not, he's not saying all the time some animal is a horse. He actually says some A is a B, right, using Greek letters. And that's a breakthrough because it, it means that he's implicitly managed to isolate logical forms rather than just giving examples. And something that inter interesting that happens in late antique philosophy, which is that Platonists want to say, first of all, that um, Plato and Aristotle agree about everything, and second of all, that Plato pretty much already figured out everything that Aristotle knew. And one of the problems they have in claiming this is that they have to claim that Plato invented logic. And given that Aristotle invented logic, that's a difficult claim to sustain. So what they do is they, they trawl through the dialogues and they pull out arguments that Socrates or whichever speaker has given and they say, look, it's a first figure syllogism if you rearrange it a little bit, right? So he invented logic, um, or at least he grasped logic. And th I think this is, is very telling that they don't get the points, right? So the, the point is that there's a difference between using logic, right, arguing rationally, and actually talking about the logical argument structure in itself. And that's what Aristotle is the first person to do. So um, I'd be interesting, interested to know what you think about this question, actually. But one thing that's sometimes argued about in literature on ancient logic is to what extent ancient and medieval logic, for that matter, is formal. And in some sense, Aristotle's logic is formal in a way that nothing had been before. So at least in the following sense, that it isolates logical forms, which were even in the tradition called forms or shapes, uh, schemata. In fact, Aris, uh, Alexander, one of the commentators I'm going to be talking about, at one point compares the logical scheme, so the all A is B, all B is C, therefore all A is C. He compares that to the form of, the, of a syllogism and then says that the matter is the terms that you plug in. So if you plug in horse, animal, uh, animal, breathing thing, then those would be the, the horse, animal, and breathing thing would be matter. And so literally you could describe logic as formal. Obviously it's not formal in any kind of mathematical sense, so there's no attempt here to um, axiomatize the system or anything like that, but there is some sense of formality that you get in uh, Aristotelian logic. And this takes us to their core arguments for the instrumentality of logic, which is that you cannot prove anything using logic until you, you, you don't know anything until you slot something in to the variables. So exactly the kind of brilliance move invented by Aristotle of uh, using variables instead of actual terms in his arguments gave the commentators a reason to say that logic is merely instrumental. Why? Well, it's because of their conception of philosophy. Their conception of philosophy, as you can see from their division into theoretical and practical, is to achieve knowledge, either in its own right or 
with the end of, doing, of being a better person. So if we look at a um, statement by Elias, which is here on the handout, he says, philosophy uses logic to show in the theoretical domain what is true and what is false, and in the practical domain what is good and what is bad. And that makes logic look very kind of big, right? So it's, you know, you can figure out truth, falsehood, good, and bad. Excellence, right? So giving logic a very big role. But it's important that he's, he says he's, that philosophy is using logic. It's not logic that does that. It's just the instrument by which you do it. Um, and I think a, a nice sign of how serious they are about something not counting as philosophy or, or even as logic, if it doesn't help you achieve truth, false, achieve knowledge of truth, falsehood, good and evil, is another dispute they had with the Stoics. So the Stoics were very good about validity. They were in, so they, they classified syllogisms just like Aristotle did, but they included anything that was a valid argument in their opinion. So they would classify something like if A, then A, as a type of argument. And they had technical words for arguments like that. And again, because, partially because the Aristotelians, just like the Platonists, wanted to say that Aristotle hadn't come up with anything that Plato, sorry, they wanted to say that everything Aristotle came up with is already in Plato. Similarly, the Aristotelians always wanted to say that Stoic logic was just a reorganization of Aristotelian logic and didn't add anything new, which is quite, again, quite difficult to sustain given that Aristotle's logic is categorial logic, so it's about predicates, and, uh, and Stoic logic is about things like hypo hypothesis, so if A, then B. Um, so the Stoics are working with kind of um, logical relations that don't really appear in Aristotle's logic. So the Aristotelians are always trying to reduce the Stoic syllogisms to the Aristotelian syllogisms. Again, historians of logic are not very impressed by this attempt. Um, but one of the other things they say is they'll take something like if A, then A, and they'll say, well, this just goes to show you how stupid the, the Stoics are because they think that that's a logical inference. Why is it not a logical inference? Well, because it's useless. What does that mean? Well, it means that you can't use it to show in the theoretical domain what is true and what is false, and you can't use it in the practical domain to show what is good and what is bad. To put it another way, it doesn't help you advance your knowledge. Right? If, if I already know A, then I know A. I don't need to be told that if A, then A. It's not helpful. Whereas the Stoics seem to have been genuinely interested in inference for its own sake, which makes sense because they think that logic is part of philosophy, and they think that the study of logic is, in a sense, the study of the structure of our knowledge or our soul, and maybe those are the same thing. In fact, they may even think that, in some small way, grasping that if A, then A is a valid inference is part of what it means to learn what it is to be a good person. Because being a good person means having correct beliefs. And so if you're a Stoic sage and someone asks you, is it, can, am I allowed to infer if this is a glass of water, then this is a glass of water, um, then the, the sage is not supposed to say, well, I'm not really sure about that, or that doesn't sound very interesting to me. The sage is supposed to say, yes, good, right? Because he never makes any mistakes. And that's part of what makes the sage a good person. So they have radically different views about, um, in this case, the importance of trivial inferences, which I think highlights their different way of conceiving logic. Um, right, so here's, here's another couple of arguments for the instrumentality of logic. Um, and this is a, an argument that I've sort of uh, summarized from a study of this by Katerina Yerodiakonu. Uh, logic is the study of the expression which we apply to a thing. It's never the study of the thing itself. What does that mean? Well, what, what they would have in mind is that what, when logic looks at a syllogism, logic isn't thinking about, again, what the terms refer to. It's just thinking about whether the things have been lined up in the right way to give you a productive syllogism. Um, 
But that means that it's not part of philosophy. Why? Well, because every part of philosophy has a distinctive range of objects that it studies. So if you look back up at the theoretical philosophy division, physics, mathematics, metaphysics, the way that they explain the difference between these three disciplines is that physics studies things that are subject to motion and rest. Um, metaphysics studies things that are free of bodies. And mathematics studies things that are immaterial but connected to bodies, like shapes and number. And that means that you individuate a philosophical discipline by saying what, uh, what the ontological cor uh, correlates are. So in other words, what the things are that it's studying. And since logic doesn't study any particular things, but only the expressions used for the things, logic isn't a part of philosophy. Notice, by the way, that that, that way of putting the argument actually helps them get more of the organon in to the study of logic. Because although I've been talking so far as if Aristotelian logic is nothing but syllogistic, there's also the categories and on interpretation, which are about single terms, how many different kinds of terms there are, and about single propositions. And by saying, oh yeah, well, logic studies expressions and their combination, they're able to include both the categories and, the, and on interpretation into the organon. Um, here's another similar argument from Alexander. Logic uh, has, well, in general, he wants to say that every discipline, even non-philosophical disciplines like, say, carpentry, are distinguished by having a subject matter and a goal. So the subject matter, the hypokaimenon of carpentry, for example, would be wood, and the goal would be producing furniture, right? So if you're working on wood trying to produce furniture, then you're a carpenter. If you're working on statements and propositions, as he says, and your goal is to prove that when propositions are compounded with one another in certain ways, something may be deduced by necessity from what is posited or conceded, then you're a logician. And that's just not what the uh, subject matter and goal of philosophy are. So the goal of philosophy is ultimately to be virtuous and to know everything. And this doesn't count for the reasons already given. Um, now, briefly, before I get on to the Arabic physician, the tradition, I should mention that the commentators do run into a bit of trouble here because remember that they're also Platonists. I mean, Alexander is not a Platonist, but the rest of them are Platonists. And they think that dialectic counts as part of logic. And then they read Plato and they see Plato using the word dialectic for what looks like is the highest kind of philosophy you can do. So, for, you know, like the, the divided line and that junk in the middle of the Republic way back when? when you were undergraduates, no? The sun, the cave, yes? Okay, and there's, remember there's this divided line and there's the cave, yeah, anyway. So when he's talking about what the philosopher does sort of at the height of the philosopher's achievement, he says that what the philosopher is doing there is dialectique, and he uses the same word in the sophist for the study of the forms, which means that they're in the awkward position of saying, Logic isn't part of philosophy. Dialectic, of course, is part of logic. We all know that. Oh, and dialectic is the most important part of philosophy. Hmm. So Ammonius has a brilliant way of getting out of this, and he exploits this formal nature of logic again. So he says that if you're only dealing with the schemata, as he calls them, the shapes or forms, but this all A is B, all B is C thing, so with the variables, then logic is only an instrument. But when you fill the gaps in with actual terms and get productive syllogisms, then that's part of philosophy. So it's both an instrument and a part, depending on whether the variables have been filled out. The, I think the only, well, my objection to this, would you might have several, but my objection to this is that if you, if you say that logic is part of philosophy when you fill in the terms, then you have to say what the other parts of philosophy would be, right? If it's only a part, there should be something left. And it seems to me that logic filled in with terms is just philosophy on this conception, right? Because it's all the syllogisms filled in with whatever you might study, whether it's about ethics or uh, politics or metaphysics, anything.
it looks like logic on this view will just be identical with philosophy. And in fact,